give a happy welcome to Irving Polidowski-Berger. Well, thank you very much, and it's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for your nice comments. I'd like to talk about the role of imagination in the survival and reinvention of an institution, in particular based on my experiences at IBM, where, as the introduction said, I worked for 37 years after finishing my studies at the University of Chicago and another three and a half years or so as a consultant. Let me say a few words about IBM. The company was founded uh, in 1911 by Thomas J. Watson Sr. and you can see that gothic looking gentleman sitting very you know, strong. Uh, he was then replaced by his son, Thomas J. Watson Jr. in the mid 1950s and that was the time when computers were beginning to take off in the commercial world. And Thomas J. Watson Jr. saw that this was going to be a big deal and he embraced the world of computing with a vengeance. His boldest move was to bring all of IBM together and develop what became the IBM System 360 family, which was announced in 1964. And all kinds of ideas came from it. It was the first platform family of computers, common architecture, from the smallest to the biggest, a new operating system, and on and on and on and on. And the 360 family and the mainframes that were its products were very, very successful for the next 20 years. And in fact, by 1984, here is the cover of Fortune magazine talking about what IBM is like. Think about the equivalent today of Apple and Google and Facebook or Microsoft in the 90s, and that was IBM was like in 1984. Now I like to remind people that when you get covers like that, the gods in Mount Olympus don't like it. <laughs> because often along with those covers comes hubris, which they like even less, and you have nowhere to go but down. And that's what happened to IBM in the subsequent years. There was a massive shift of technologies with the development of microprocessors. Personal computers became more and more powerful and started competing in something called client-server computing with the mainframes. And if you want to add insult to injury, don't forget which were the most popular personal computers in their day the IBM PC. What happened is IBM was making so much money from the mainframes that it didn't realize what an incredible thing it had with the IBM PC. And things keep getting worse and worse and worse until in 1992, only eight years later, here is the sad cover in Fortune magazine with the slow, pitiful dinosaur along with two other then slow, pitiful dinosaurs, General Motors and Sears Roebuck. <coughs> IBM was really having a near-death experience in 1992, and to me, nothing says that better than this little paragraph that looks like an obituary, but it was actually in the editorial page of the New York Times. And when this is what the New York Times says about you in its editorial page, life is not good. <laughs> and IBM came very, very close to disappearing. But we didn't disappear, 
and the company was able to transform itself, it reinvented itself, it went through a massive restructure, it had a whole new technical strategy, it emphasized software and services in addition to hardware, it went through a major cultural <coughs> transformation, and this was all possible because IBM got a great new CEO. Lou Gerstner, who was the first CEO who came to IBM from the outside. And we were really lucky. Other companies have gone through very terrible times. They've gotten marquee CEOs and they still died. Because most companies that go through the kinds of troubles IBM went through absolutely disappear. We were lucky. We got one of the absolutely very best. And he's been lionized ever since for the job he did in the transformation, the turnaround of IBM, which he described in an excellent book that he published in 2002 about his almost 10 years at IBM, who says elephants can dance. And in his book, Lou explained what happened. So, how come IBM almost died? How come in eight years we went from being at the top of our game to almost dying? And the answer is once more the Stoffos Greek tragedy. What was once your main strength is likely to be your undoing if you don't pay attention to it. All the people who built IBM to be the powerful, the powerful company that once was just couldn't believe that it was time to change. They couldn't bring themselves to make that change. And so IBM continued to live in this outmoded world way after the world had already changed. But as I said, we survived. We came out of intensive care around the mid-1990s. By 1995, all the various tubes stuck to us and so on were gone. The company was going to make it. But now it was time to try to restore IBM's fame. We didn't want to be known. Let's say you go to a party and somebody sees you and they say, where do you work? I say, IBM. It wouldn't be nice if they say, oh my god, I thought you were dead. <laughs> Thank god you're alive. You want to do a little bit better than that. And I think the gods took pity on us. Because right around the time we were ready, they sent us this gift, the internet. The mid-90s is when the internet was taking off. And I think the gods were saying, here it is, guys. Don't screw it up this time. And my God, like reformed sinners, we latched on to the internet for all it was worth, and we embraced it with an incredible passion. Late in 1995, Lou Gerstner declared at a major speech in Comdex in Las Vegas that IBM was going to essentially embrace the internet in everything that we did. Uh, we established a new internet division. I was the general manager of that division. And now it was time to build an IBM internet strategy. And as Lou said in his book, what he liked about the internet is that it was everything that IBM had not been in the past. And so if you want a major cultural transformation, Pick something very different, as opposed to do what you were doing in the past slightly better. And we were very successful. We developed what became our business strategy. And we really, once more, got the company restored to a very nice position. And by the late, the late 1990s, once more, these are the kinds of articles we were getting about IBM. IBM had come back as a major presence in the internet, and so things were better, at least for the time. 
So what did I learn? What were the key lessons that I learned from that painful experience on the way down, but very sweet experience on the way up? First of all, it's really important to face up to reality. We all talk about change, and we all talk about how wonderful innovation is, how great it is to change. People don't like to change. Change is really scary. And especially if you have done very well, if you are established and successful, change feels like your enemy. But what happens if, whether you like it or not, the world change? Your old technologies are no longer the key ones. The internet microprocessors are here. You have to face reality and get with the program. And the second major thing I learned is that the key to being able to embrace the change is to reimagine the future, to have a vision of, OK, so if I do all these things, I embrace the internet, I embrace services, I embrace software, what is the world going to be like? And go on a journey that is scary because you don't know how it's going to work out, but in reality, you have nothing to lose. Because if you stay put, we know exactly what's going to happen, and that's what happened to many, many companies. Now, Tolstoy once said that if you want to learn about the world and if you want to be universal, describe your village. Now, I've been talking about cosmic companies, cosmic problems like IBM, the technology, but let me get back now to my village, Westport, and let me now get to the Westport Library in particular, and let me talk a little bit about libraries. And let me start by pointing out that in the late 19th century, there was a massive transformation in the US and other parts of the world from the industrial, from the agricultural economy to the industrial economy. When people were working in farms, they didn't know how to read and write. And literacy wasn't quite as important. I don't mean people didn't know how to read and write. Many did, but it wasn't critical to know how to read and write and literacy. When you now moved to cities and had jobs in industry, you had to learn to read and write. And that was the beginning of public education in the US and other countries. But at the same time, that's when public libraries were born. And they were born thanks to the effort of this gentleman, Andrew Carnegie, who was a major steel magnate from Pittsburgh, and then became a major philanthropist. And what Andrew Carnegie did a lot of is establish the notion of the local community libraries for informal education to complement the public education of the schools. That was very important because we were getting lots and lots of immigrants into the country who have to somehow become more literate and integrated into the country. And over the next 40 years, Andrew Carnegie established over 2,500 public libraries in the English-speaking world, almost 1,700 of them in the US alone. So here I am, late in the 1990s. The internet was going very well in IBM. And I started to hang out a lot in the Westport Public Library around the same time that we got a dynamic new director, Maxine Blywise. And one of the things that Maxine and I talked a lot about is 
what will be the role, if any, of the community library in the internet-based information age? Because a lot of people were saying that once the internet hit, the world would become totally digital, it would become totally virtual, people would stay at home, shopping all day from their computers, uh, people would move to faraway places where land was cheap, cities would disappear. Remember, they called it the dot-com bubble. So there is a reason all that hype was said. And we were wondering, who needs books? Who needs a library building? What is it going to be like? Maxine then set up an advisory board. I was a member of it to work with her and others to try to figure out what is going to happen? What should we be doing? And this is what we discovered over the next 17 years from 1998 to now. First of all, in a world where we are absolutely awash with information, people who know how to organize and curate that information are very, very valuable. Those people are often called librarians. That's what they do for a living. So the more information you have, the more people who know how to do that is very important. The second thing is really wonderful. The more we live in our life in the virtual world, the more we really like physical interactions. The virtual world is very nice, but there is something about physical interactions that I think of in the very nerdy term of broadband pheromonic interactions, <laughs> where lots and lots of signals are going back and forth. And trust me, that's very different from a Skype conversation with somebody. And finally, and not surprisingly, in the knowledge economy, learning is more important than ever, not just K through 12, not just college or even graduate school, but throughout your whole life. And so libraries have assumed this major role to be the centers for the community, for all kinds of learning activities, all kinds of information activities, seminars like this one and many others, and in fact, instead of the physical libraries disappearing, more and more libraries are bursting at their seams, like the Westport Public Library. And here are some pictures of some brand new libraries that have been built in cities around the world, from Seattle to the Netherlands, that show the future really wasn't what we thought it was going to be, you just have to keep going. So finally, what did we learn in our experience with the Westport Public Library? And it's back to the same lessons. The first one, face up to the reality of what's going on and make the changes you need to make. And the second one, reimagine the future and don't be afraid to embark on the journey. Thank you very much.